so once again, my name is Professor Julie Black Peart, and I am the Senior Clinical Coordinator for the Physician Assistant Program here at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. We have a wonderful program for you today, and we're so happy to see all of you because it's really all about what are you going to do in your future? And obviously all of you have started planning already about what you think you'd like to do in your future. A couple of housekeeping tools, because you're all young professionals. I'd like everybody to make sure that their phone is on silent. So if you forgot to turn your ringer off, you might want to go ahead and do that now. And they do not allow food and drink in the auditorium, so we're asking you if you could please be making sure that you refrain from that. And um, later on, uh, we're going to have food for you, and we're just thankful that everybody was able to make it today. So. We have a few schools here today. Let's start with a little housekeeping. We have about 147 of you. Let's see, Clara Barton, where are you? In the back. Whoop, whoop, Clara Barton. <laughs> I went to PS241, which is right next to Clara Barton. All righty, and we have seven of you from the 10, oh my goodness, 10. We have 13, where's William E. Grady High School? Yes, William E. Grady, welcome. And 22 from the Academy for Health Careers. Where are you? <laughs> Welcome. We have two schools, Urban Academy for Collaborative Healthcare. 17 from there. Where are you? <laughs> Woo! Okay, they get the award so far, the loudest. <laughs> cool. Now I have to figure out what I'm giving you for an award. Okay. We have next. 22 students from Urban Academy for Emergency Management, all the way from Manhattan. Where are you? Oh, see, now I put it out there. <laughs> Very nice. We have 18 students from Thomas Edison High School from Jamaica, Queens. All right. See, I went to St. John's University for my first degree, so I know a little bit about Jamaica, Queens. We have Bayside High School from Bayside, Queens, 22. All right, you're hanging out back there with the Clara Barton folks. Watch it now. And we have, last but never least, 26 students from the Institute for Health Professions in Cambria Heights, Queens. Where are you? <laughs> Wonderful. All in all, we have 147 of you. This is a wonderful turnout for our first event today. Now, um, before we, before we go on, you know, I always fashion myself to be rather cool. I don't know, how do I look? Do I look cool today? But you know what, I, I found out I'm not that cool. You know why I'm not that cool? I haven't seen the Black Panther movie yet. Mm -hmm. uh, who, show of hands, did you see the movie? <laughs> oh my gosh, so I'm not the only one here who needs an extra cool button. But needless to say, we're going to move things right along. I don't want to um, take up any more time. Let's greet Dr. Bridget Desport, who is our Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives, very much involved in getting this program started for you today, along with other uh, faculty and staff who I will introduce later on today. But for now, Ms. Bridget Desport, let's welcome her to the podium. So welcome to SUNY Downstate Medical Center. And as uh, Professor, um, you know, I'm gonna mess your name up, Black Peart, Peart, oh, sorry, Black Peart uh, just introduced me. I am Bridget C. Desport, and I am the uh, Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives here at the College of Health-Related Professions, which is one of five colleges here at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. So today you're gonna learn about six of the professions that we offer here at our college. And I hope that through this learning process, you will consider one of the professions as your, in your future uh, as a career. So ask lots of questions, be engaged, learn a lot, and I hope that you enjoy this experience and your time here. Thank you. So next we're going to have uh, Gabrielle Crescent. Um, she's going to give you an overview of, of AHEC and what that's about. It's the reason that you're here today. We really want to get everybody involved later on in this program. And, oh, she's standing right there. Without any further ado, let me move right along. Thank you so very much. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? 
Good. I'm so glad you're here. We tried to do this before on March 22nd, and we had the snowstorm. So thank you for coming with this very short, short notice. I especially want to thank the staff and faculty of, of Downstate for going through all this trouble um, you know, to put this together. I really appreciate it. Special thanks to, to Dr. Bridget Despard, Philip Bones, who we, we spoke to daily. <laughs> um, because it's a, it's a lot of work trying to get these things together. And I also especially want to thank the teachers and work-based coordinators. I know I nagged you guys constantly. Please send me your permission slips. Please send me your forms. I really, really do appreciate it. So I'm just going to say a few words about AHEC. It stands for Area Health Education Center. Um, and I'm the director of that program. It's a national program. They have them in every state in the country, including Hawaii, Alaska. I'm downtown Brooklyn. I, I represent Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island. There's one in Manhattan. There's one in the Bronx. And we, there's three goals of AHEC. The first goal is to increase the diversity of the health professions. What that means is that they want people from every culture, every background to go into health care, whether you Haitian, Asian, white. We want all cultures because health care depends on all kinds of people to go into the health care system. And right now we have a shortage. Um, the second thing is to go is to increase the future health care workforce. You are the future. We don't have enough health care professionals in various fields um, to go into health care. And people are living longer, so we need more of you guys to take care of us as we get older. So we definitely need more health care professionals. And the third thing is to increase um, the health of underserved communities. There's a lot of communities in Brooklyn and other neighborhoods, they don't have enough doctors, people don't don't have enough appropriate care. We want to make sure we improve the health care of, of the communities. So um, what I want to say to you students is that there are a lot of people that um, are here to help you in terms of guiding you to decide what you want to do as a health career. You don't have to decide today. You have, you have some time, and there's a lot of people help, to help you. I work collaboratively with Downstate and some other schools. Um, when I was young, I didn't know that they had all these people out to help me. There's, you can call any one of us if you need some guidance, if you need more information. Um, and there's over 200 something health careers. So there's medicine, there's nursing, but there's also public health, um, there's medical imaging, there's a number of health careers. So what I want you to know is that you're an asset. We want you to succeed. And there's a lot of people like me to help, you know, that's out here to help you. So listen and learn, um, take notes. You can email any one of us with any additional information. You can come back at Downstate and visit. So good luck and enjoy the program. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kersant. Once again, a nice round of applause for her. Without AHEC, we wouldn't be having today's wonderful program. And just give us a moment. We need to move this table back because we're about to have a wonderful presentation for you by the adolescent education program called Living Our Lives. A young person's perspective will be presented to you. Uh, we have four people here from that program and then some students are gonna come up and actually do a wonderful skit for you. Um, I'd just like to thank um, the director, Christine Rucker. If she could just stand and say, just, and she's in the back. Okay, we have James Dorsanville, uh, Kaya Williams, and first up is gonna be Mr. Anthony Thompson who will give you a brief introduction of what they're about to do. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Thompson. Well, good morning, good morning. Hello, how is everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we are the Adolescent Education Program here at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. And one of the things that we do is we have a group of teenagers that oftentimes we find or discover when we go out into schools and do health education workshops. Clara Barton is one of the schools that I've been into many of times. And I think the last time I did some workshops at your school was probably about a year and a half ago. Um, I'm going to be here. I'm going to try to be here for most of the program. So if you don't feel that you have enough health education, um, sex education, STD, HIV, pregnancy prevention education in your schools, in your classrooms, reach out to me, tell your teacher to contact me so that we could potentially get into your school and provide some education. One of the other in our program is we hire high school students such as yourself. 
and we teach them how to go out into the communities to teach you guys the correct information about HIV, STD, hepatitis, and pregnancy prevention, and also birth control. Kaya Williams and James Dorsonville are two of the young people who we found in uh, med high school for medical professions, and he went to Brooklyn Law and Tech. We discovered them maybe about three or four years ago when we were in their schools doing workshops, and they applied for the program, and they got hired. They've been with us now three or four years. They've graduated from high school, and they're currently going to college in the area. So they're here today to do several mini skits on issues that you may go through in your future, something you may be going through now. Or maybe it's not you, maybe it's a friend of yours or a family member, okay? So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Kaya Williams and James Dorsonville who are going to do three mini skits for you on issues that we deal with in our program. Thank you very much. I mean, that's what comes with being the man in your school. Feel me? Top player in the school, probably the top player in Brooklyn. But, I mean, when you get all the honeys, there's a price to pay, right? So let me take that back a couple weeks. I've been messing with this girl Mercedes. She's cool and all. Yeah, we're intimate sometimes, and sometimes condoms are not always used. But she came to me saying she was pregnant. And now, I didn't know how to react to that. I don't know how to handle that. I'm a kid myself, how am I gonna raise a baby? But I guess I shouldn't have been having unprotected sex, right? But man, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Now I'm in this sticky situation. But I know what I do have to do, I have to man up, have to own up to my responsibilities, because this is what I get, right? When you make bad decisions, bad things happen. But to be honest, I want to go to college. A baby might stop that, it might not, but I know whatever I do decide to do, it's gonna be the right decision for me and mine. My name is Ashley. You see, my friends, they out here having sex everywhere. In the bathroom, in school, but they're getting pregnant and getting STDs left and right. You see me, I'm abstinent. I can't go through all of that. My best friend told me that she was pregnant a couple days ago, and now she got to put her dreams of college on hold to take care of a baby. That's crazy, but it couldn't be me. I'm not the best in school. I'm not the smartest, but I know the right decisions to make when it comes to my health. Okay, so that was a little segment of um, segment called Street Talk, which we do when we go out to the communities, which we talk about stuff that happens, you know, um, in teens' lives. So how do you guys feel about that? Any comments on it? Any questions? Anything you liked, didn't like? Anybody want to speak about it? All right, huh? go find the money. Who raised their hand? We have a mic. Um... So why didn't anybody mention like um, birth control and, and that stuff? So with the situations that we did, particularly in our um, characters' lives, there was no birth control used. He's, birth, condoms are a form of birth control, which he didn't use in his situation. And then with my situation, I was abstinent, so I didn't have to worry about none of that. Gotcha. OK, thank you. Okay, so like I feel like it's true because like these girls these days they be having sex everywhere and not only boys but like a lot of people don't use protection and like nowadays in high school like there's many girls pregnant but like 
you could have like abortions, I guess, or like Plan Bs, but I guess like no one does that. So uh-huh. with a lot of people, a lot of people, um, it's against their religion, against what they believe in to have abortions or to even use birth control. Uh, what was the second part that you said? Plan B. Plan B. Plan B is not a form of birth control. That's more like emergency. So like, let's say uh, a girl was having, um, was having, was intimate with her boyfriend or with somebody she was messing with and the condom pops. That's what Plan B is used for. It's not used as like, birth control where you take it all the time because it has bad effects to your body where, you know, you can damage, um, you won't be able to have babies in the future, stuff like that, you can damage your um, reproductive system. Okay, anybody else? All right, so we're gonna go into our next segment which is a skit called Communications. Ring, 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 ring. Who is this calling me? Ring, ring. Hello? Ashley. Sis, I don't know you. (laughs) You saying Ashley, 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 Ashley from where? Wait, Ashley from Jason's party? Oh, Jason, Jason. Oh, Jason, Jason, Jason. Oh. Yeah, I know, I know who you're talking about. I know who you're talking about. I know who you're talking about. Oh, so what's up? I mean, yeah, we had fun that night, right? I know. Yeah. You got something to tell me. Yo, you're not trying to come to the crib? Like, all right, all right, all right. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. All right, you went to the doctor. He told you you have chlamydia. And I should get tested? Why, why do I have to get tested? I feel fine. I feel great, I'm not experiencing nothing, so I don't know what to tell you. And I have a whole girlfriend, so I don't know what you want me to tell you. Okay, all right, bye. Nah, she's crazy, like, uh-uh. Hey, babe. <laughs> why, wait, why do you look like this? Um, we, got, we gotta go in nah, like 15 minutes. Like, I was chilling. Oh, so when are you gonna change? Why, why do you, you look like, like this? We gotta go somewhere, we like, the Uber's outside, we don't have time. Our reservation is in like 15 minutes, we gotta go. All right, babe, just, let me just talk to you real quick, all right? I'm gonna just, I'm not, you know what? No, I'm not, this is what you could do. Look, go in the room real quick, change. No, you could come with this. Come no, on, the Uber's let me, outside. No, let me talk. Oh my God, go ahead. Hurry up, hurry up. Make it speedy, let's go. All right. So you know Jason, Jason? <laughs> no, I don't know who Jason, who's Jason? Jason, 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 Jason. You know the, Jason. Oh, the one. <laughs> yes. Jason that you be with down the block. Yes, you know we, oh we my playing God. ball, you know, football. Come on. All okay. right. So you remember his party? The one I told you not to go to, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, so you went? It wasn't my fault. They forced me, but oh, that's so another story. Oh, so you did story. go. How somebody forced you to go to a party? All right, I went to the party. Okay, I should have told you. All right, all right, all right. <sighs> the party was lit. Everybody was there. You wasn't there. So. Well, that's why I didn't want you to go, because I wasn't there. All right, so long story short, you know, it's a party, so people drinking. I've taken a couple of drinks. You was drinking, babe? We already no. spoke about this. Like, I don't want you drinking because, you know, your behavior, you don't know how to control yourself. I know, I know. You know, I know like, your judgment is not nah, all the way I, there. I, nah, I know, I know, I know. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been drinking because. All right, so. Ashley called me, right? I don't Ashley. Even, I don't even know her. Dirty Ashley? I... The one that be having sex everywhere, like in the staircase with people? That's crazy. Why is she calling your phone? Y'all friends? Wait, whoa, 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 staircase. Staircase, Ashley. Staircase, Ashley. She had sex with everyone? Yes. Why are you scratching your head like that? Come on, I already told you we got, we got 10 more minutes left. All right, um, 
She called me saying she went to the doctor. She got chlamydia. I might have it. I need to go get tested. Whoa. You might have. Wait, how, how does that have to do with you? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> she's saying. She's saying. No, she's saying. No. She's saying. She's saying that we might have, you know, hooked up, you know, at what? the party or something. But I don't what? remember that. Like I said, I was drinking, so. Whoa, 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 whoa. You hooked up with Ashley? Bitch, she's saying that. I don't and she have chlamydia? So that means you're trying to give me chlamydia? Like, we're not in a relationship? Like, what are you doing? I'm not trying to give you nothing. Come on, don't no. even do that. No. Because now you have chlamydia and you're trying to give me chlamydia. All right, I'm sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No. Whoa. You don't know that you have it. You obviously have it. You, you slept with her, right? But we need to go get tested, though. That's the more important thing, babe. Come on. Stop acting like that. No. What you're going to do, you're going to leave and you're going to go get tested. I'm going to go get tested by myself. Because that's crazy. How you do that? That's crazy. I'm done. Now we got time. Let me get time. Um, all right. So obviously you guys enjoyed that one. Um, that that skit right there is called communications, and. With that skit, but, all right, so what did you guys think of it? Like, what should have happened? How should what, it have ended? Should I have left and like broke up with him or should we go, yes, leave him? How many people think I should have went with him and got tested? No? Okay. Wait, oh, so, so oh. Like, I feel like if, that's your boyfriend, and like, if you really care about him, then, and if you forgive him for what he did, then I feel like you should have went with him. But, <laughs> hold on, let her speak, let her speak, let her speak. But out of anger, I feel like you should have just left and broke up with him, and like, die on his own. Okay, okay. But, like, um, do you feel it's important to actually, like, just sit down and talk to one another and see, like, how one another is doing and making sure that they're okay, even though he did mess up, just making sure that their their health and their well being is, you know, intact. You agree? All right. Y'all agree? Yeah. All right. So with that with that being said, the whole message of the skit is just making sure that you are in like that you have good communication with your partner and someone that you are intimate with because that is very important and when you're having sex, you should be mature enough to talk about it and the things that come with it, guys. So just remember that. And if you are not having sex right now, that's just one thing to think about. All right. So lastly, we're going to be doing a segment called Role Model Stories. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I started dating this guy, Rashid, not too long ago. You know, he's brown skinned, 6'3", captain of the football team. Y'all already know. <laughs> But look, we don't, use, we don't use condoms, but I'm protected from everything that I want to be protected from because I'm on birth control. You know, I thought I was good. I thought I was good. So my homegirl came up to me the other day and she said that she have an STD and she got it from her boyfriend who she's faithful to and it's only them two. So that means he gave her the STD. And I'm just like, so many things are running through my head. What could happen to me? I know I'm faithful to Rashid, but is he being faithful to me? How do I talk to him? Will he think I'm sleeping around? What would he think I'm doing? What would he think of me? What would you guys do? So I've been messing with this girl named Jennifer. And we've been together for a year and a half, but it wasn't a year and a half straight, because you know, we would have breaks. You know, we were on and off all the time. So when we were off, I was doing my own thing, you know? And when she was off, who knows what she was doing? But in all honesty, I could say that like, I actually cared about her. But she came to me saying that she was pregnant, but it was a home pregnancy test. So I was a little, although I was nervous, I was a little iffy about it because I wasn't too sure it was accurate. Because, man, I wasn't ready to have no baby. I was a kid myself. So we went to the clinic, made sure that we got tested, and 
It turns out it was a false positive. Woo! Man, did that teach me a lesson. Because you know what I'm going to do from now on? I'm not having no sex. <laughs> I'm not drinking. I'm not going to do any drugs and nothing. And you know what that's called? Abstinence. And I plan on keeping. <laughs> and I plan on keeping to that promise. Okay, guys, so any comments about that? That was the last thing we're doing. All right. <laughs> oh, oh. All right, you then. Okay, um, I think, <laughs> I think that they should have, like, got tested together or whatever to see and use the condom for the thing. Mm -hmm. oh, for, the, for the skit, uh-huh. Yeah, that... And then if they would deal with it to see if they were faithful or not, whatever. And then you should leave him and throw bleach on him and beat him. Oh, my God. No, 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 no guys, no. No, no, no. Everybody no, needs guys. some okay. discipline. No, no, no. Moving along. <laughs> no, no. That's not healthy, guys. Don't. Yo, Kaya. I'm talking, um, the skit, I think that she should have approached him saying like, you know, like, oh, I'm being faithful to you, but are you really being faithful to me? Like, just talk to each other. But then if he was like talking to like a whole other girl and then thinking that she was pregnant, doesn't that like kind of, kind of cheating a little bit, you know? Like, that's cheating, boy. Any other comments? Um, no, oh, no, unfortunately, okay. like, our time is up, and we have to go, but <laughs> we want to... Yeah, oh, we're just going to tell you a little guys. bit. I don't want to go, but... We don't want to leave you guys, but... Okay. okay, so um, on May 19th, we have a event coming up, and we're going we're gonna to be doing theater. There's going to be a bunch of other theater groups that's going to come and perform, and it's called Bates. It's going to be right here in this auditorium in the, in the Basic Science Building, and it's on May 19th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you want to come out, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that's going to be interesting. It's going to be workshops. It's going to be testing, everything, free, 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 and free food. So... You know, hope that was a giveaway, free food. But um, to wrap this up, um, I'm Kaya. I'm about to be 20, and I go to St. Joseph's College. I'm a nursing major, um, about to go into my clinicals in the fall. Um, and thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. I've been in the program for five years. Um, I'm the program assistant, uh, assistant for the Youth Health Advocate Project here. So, yeah, that's yeah. me. All right, so quickly, I'm James. I'm 19, about to be 22. Well, 20 also, and I'm, I go to John Jay College, and I've been in the program for five years, and I'm a Youth Health Advocate under the YAP Project. Thank you. Thank you, guys. James and Kaya, they really deserve another hand for that. That was really phenomenal. Thank you so very much. <laughs> that's, that's more than I ever expected you folks were going to get, and they really had a wonderful message to give. So there were some flyers um, being handed out. This is the one for the May 19th event. So if you have that, make sure you get this one. And then there's an, a flyer I see also for an open house on May 25th also. Uh, teens helping each other, Theo. So check this one out as well, okay? Absolutely, absolutely. So you may have noticed on our agenda, I skipped over one small thing, just in the essence of time, but I'm going to track back to the office of our president. Uh, Dr. Riley is unable to be here today, but he has sent 
representatives from his office who will speak with you briefly. And we have Jelani Dijong, who is the Director of Government Relations, and Tayeb Rashid, who is from President Riley's office, President Riley's personal assistant. So give them a hand. Thank you so much. And then I'll be right back. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? How's it going today? You guys seem tired or hungry or both. Uh, my name is Jelani Deshong. I'm the Director of Government Relations here at SUNY Downstate. And on behalf of the President, I'd just like to welcome you here to SUNY Downstate Medical Center. Um, and hopefully you guys enjoy and hopefully one day see you guys as potential students here at SUNY Downstate. We have a lot of great uh, programs. We graduate some of the, I would say, some of the best doctors, some of the best nurses, some of the best professionals in healthcare uh, here in Brooklyn. Uh, so uh, welcome, and I'd like to introduce T uh, TJ, as I call him, Batea Rashid, who is an alumni uh, of SUNY Downstate, and we'll just like, speak to you, who's speaking to you now, and they're speaking to you after you guys come back from lunch. So uh, thank you guys, and have a good day. Good morning, everyone. Um, Jelani took a lot of what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I am uh, the administrative fellow to the president of SUNY Downstate Medical Center, and I just wanted to welcome you on his behalf and um, hope that today you will learn a lot and leave inspired uh, to pursue a career in healthcare in any relevant fields that you learn today. And I'll be speaking to you again later on about my experience at the School of Public Health. So I hope you all enjoy the day and um, are hopefully hungry because lunch is up, I believe. So, uh, <laughs> so greetings and uh, I'll see you later. So thank you so much. We've had, we've had skits, we've had welcome, we've had everything else. This is Mr. Philip Bones. He is Associate Dean here at SUNY Downstate as well. And there's a whole lot of other folks, um, a lot of uh, faculty and staff from the schools here that were very integral in putting together this program. We just wanted to take a moment to recognize you, Mr. Bones, for your efforts in putting this program together. Okay, so let's ask some questions. We have different programs here. Who knows what a physician assistant is? Okay, I recognize this young man over here. What do you, what do you think a physician assistant is? Okay, so he says they're like a doctor. They haven't gone through as much training, and it's a little bit of a more simplified method uh, that uh, PAs go through, and he's absolutely pretty much correct about that, and we'll be discussing that a little bit more later on when we go to the sessions on all the schools. How about occupational therapy? Dr. Desport here Somebody's was faculty the on the occupational, know about ther occupational therapy. Who thinks they know what occupational therapists do? Somebody. Oh, there's a hand over you know, there, Dr. Oh, Desport. Right. Oh, we have a lady, well, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I think what it is is like when you have, okay, like for example, if you like are in, like, in a car accident and like you hurt your knee, you need surgery, like the therapy that you need, like the exercising, that, like, I don't know, it's hard to explain. You're doing good. You, you Keep going. I mean? Like, it's like, when you hurt your knee and you have a surgery, right? And like, <laughs> and your knee isn't like working, like it's like, it needs to heal. And in order to get like, like the full function, you need to like, I don't know, just say <laughs> she's, she's So what you're talking about is rehabilitation. Actually, that's more of what a physical therapist does. So occupational therapy, yes? Uh. Occupational therapist is a therapist that helps people with motor skills, stuff like that. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Okay. That's yes, one. and we'll be talking a little bit more Anyone about that. Else? Yes, a nice hand for her. Young man, would you like to still take a stab at it? Uh, in addition to fine motor skills, I think occupational therapists normally work with people who have like work-related injuries and not like severe like sports injuries like a physical therapist would deal with. 
That's true too. And what you'll find is, is that we are in the, what we call the allied health professions here at the school and we all end up actually work closely hand in hand when it's time to treat and manage patients with either some sort of illness or a disability. And you'll find out a little bit more as we go on how that actually works. Okay, what about a midwife? Anybody have an idea? They know. The yeah. students from Clara Barton, I, I know somebody from over there at Clara Barton knows what a midwife is. There's somebody yeah, in the back. That would be cheating, so we should <laughs> um, it, A midwife is someone that like helps the process of the birthing, right? And then like uh, maybe also takes care of the baby afterwards while the mom recovers. Absolutely, cool, cool, absolutely. Cool. They, they do do that. Anyone have something to add to that? Yeah? You have something to add, young lady? Yes or no? No, okay. Um, also, like, instead of being in a hospital, they could, like, help them at home, like, help with home birth, water birth, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, she's on it. <laughs> Most yeah. definitely, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so there's more. Um, let's see. Medical informatics. We have a brilliant audience here, so, so far, so good. Medical informatics. You see, now the thing about some of the programs that we have here, they're not what most people traditionally think about when they think about going into a health-related career. And that's why we have this program, because there's so many other areas of medicine and health-related fields that you can really think about. When most people think about going into health careers, they think about either becoming a doctor or a nurse most of the time. Most people know about physical therapy. Some people do know about occupational therapy and some other uh, areas, but or being a rad tech with people who um, take x-rays or uh, what about diagnostic medical imaging? Oh. We took a pass on the medical informatics. We're going to come back to that we're gonna one. Come, we're going to come back to, we're gonna come back to that diagnostic one. Diagnostic medical imaging? Diagnostic medical imaging. Um, I believe that that has to do with sonography, like ultrasounds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It does. Okay, so they use something called a transducer to send the sound waves and get photographs. And so, so when the woman goes for her um, sonogram and she wants to find out what gender the baby's going to be, usually that's somebody from the ultrasound department who does that. Let me see. Uh, we need to come back to medical informatics. Nobody has an idea? Yeah. Oh, my I, goodness. That I, hand I went up very go briskly. The, go I like that. I'm going to go and then I'm going to come back to you, okay? Because I saw her isn't there something about computers, dealing with computers? And it does. It, you know, it's you're getting there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll take it. Let's 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 take the add-on over here. And I'm gonna make sure I don't miss any programs while we're waiting. Um, it's basically the intersection of medical science, information science, and computer science. I, I, well, well. Okay. And she has the orange nail polish. It, she does. It, but I'm it. telling you, Beautiful. Chirp, we claimed orange as our color for the exactly. College of Health Related Professions. Dr. Desport and I, a, a team here. Okay, so last but not least for a different college, we have to public health. The, we have a master's of public health program and we have a certificate of public health program here as well. So who thinks they know? What, program. Uh, yeah, and a doctor. Oh, how can I miss that? Yeah. And what else? Anybody know what that's about, public health? A li might have a little something to do with what our skits were about today. Mm -hmm. That could be something involved in it. Come on, public health. Oh. Public health. <laughs> um, I think it has to do with um, helping the community, like giving them support through medical advice, uh -huh. information. In information, a lot of information, yeah. So. People from these um, departments will be speaking with you today, but hey, if you're a germaphobe and you want to know what to avoid and what's causing this particular illness or that, but everybody's heard about the, the bird vi flu and the West Nile virus and the Zika virus, and uh, people from public health get a lot of knowledge in all these different areas and things, and then they disseminate, and there's a whole lot of other wonderful stuff that goes along with that. So, we have one more. We have one more. Public health is basically the profession of addressing all main issues known to the public? Yes, very much so, very much so. So I'm gonna give everybody a round of applause. Mm -hmm. 
I know I put you on the spot a little bit, but everybody did really wonderfully. Absolutely. So we would we really want to get everybody thinking about all these different areas that you can go into. And as it is exactly 11:50 right now, let's go to lunch. <laughs> physician assistant uh, classroom. This is where the magic happens for the PA program. And um, today is a very special day for our students. They are actually doing poster presentations today. And this is something that's uh, very commonly known in the uh, medical, um, uh, medical um, careers where a lot of uh, poster presentations are done about uh, issues that are going on in health and public health. And um, this is just a little taste of something that you might actually do if you decide to pursue one of the health-related careers that we have here at SUNY Downstate, even if it's public health or whatever school that you might happen to go to. So um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about PA. We're going to have more formal presentations downstairs. But basically, um, what the young man said downstairs was pretty much true. Physician assistants are providers that assist doctors in healthcare, but we don't assist them in the way that the doctor has to be there and we're just with the doctor every single moment of the day. We actually work very much autonomously. Doc, uh, PAs can do pretty much whatever a doctor does, and we call that working within the scope of the practice of the doctor. So if you happen to be working with a dermatologist, you do dermatology. If you happen to be working in emergency medicine, you do emergency medicine only. But there are some perks to being a physician assistant, which I'll discuss downstairs. Uh, right here, you are in our classroom. This is where the didactic phase goes on here at SUNY Downstate. Students send, spend one year and three months here in the classroom, and then they go off to a year of clinical studies. So after you've gotten your pizza, we want to invite you to please feel free to walk around, speak to some of our students, look at some of the posters, see what we're about, ask them some questions. And then when we go downstairs later on at 1, we'll discuss a little bit more about what the SUNY Downstate PA program has to offer. So I want to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. And we'll look forward to seeing you downstairs later on. Enjoy your lunch. So we're here in the Downstate PA classroom with students who are doing their poster presentations today. So why don't you introduce yourselves and tell us what your poster is about. Hi, my name is Christy Jean Charles, and today we, oh, thank you. Um, our poster is on reducing the risk, fighting the rate of infant mortality. I'll introduce you to my other team members. My name is Ibuko Alonja. And I'm Allison Lawson. And basically we chose um, infant mortality because while doing our research on East, um, East New York, we noticed that the rate of infant mortality is a lot higher than the national rate, which is about 6.1, as well as overall Brooklyn, as you can see on our poster. The, the rate for infant mortality is 7.8 versus New York City being 4.7 altogether. Now, what is infant mortality? Infant mortality is the rate of infants dying prior to their first birthday multiplied by 1,000. Um, welcome to SUNY Downstate. We hope you like our poster. Thank you. So why don't you introduce yourselves, and what's your name? My name is Falana. Sharif. My name is Karina. Dania. 
Okay, so Svetlana is going to lead us off and she's going to tell us what the entire poster presentation is about today. Thank you. So we're representing Sunset Park. Uh, it was actually in the news recently, starting last year and recently even as of April 11, 2018. Tuberculosis has increased drastically to a point of uh, reversing a 24-year drop. So we're representing Sunset Park and we're showing the difference between latent TB and TB disease. We want to intervene with the neighborhood by actually working inside the neighborhood. We want to promote going to the neighborhood through shuttle buses, uh, increasing awareness, increasing compliance, and overall decreasing the spread and decreasing costs for them as well. Um, you want to say something else? You well, say something else. we invented um, our website where you can uh, learn about TV and about, about treatments. And uh, one of the part of our uh, uh, of our website is a g game, so Lana will demonstrate it. So a tuberculosis game is, uh, we actually found it, it's, uh, it teaches you ha what exactly it is, sorry, and when you play it, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When it does work, you get to play the doctor and you get to identify under a microscope. Uh, it's an acid fast stain and you check and you can identify which ones are the tuberculosis as opposed to other ones. So hopefully through the fun of internet cafes, we can spread the <coughs> awareness and also decrease it for the community. How did you adjust from like high school to high school? High school. That's not the same thing. That's not the same thing. No, it's rough. It's rough because we need to know that there's more responsibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you just have to you know, stay true to yourself. Suppose I was to tell you that um, Brooklyn is 3.5 more times likely to have HIV than the U.S. in general. Would you say that's an alarming result? Would you be shocked to hear that? Yeah. Yeah. I, would. I mean, yeah. I, I would expect it. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I would expect this. So. Midwifery is a profession. Um, it's a profession in and of its own. A lot of people think that it's a part of nursing, but it's not. Um, you can be a midwife while not being a nurse, and you can be a midwife and be a nurse at the same time. It's your choice. Um, as Sarah mentioned, Downstate is one of, I think, two colleges um, in the U.S. where you are offered the opportunity to become a direct entry midwife where you don't need to come from nursing, and it's a graduate program, three-year program here, or it's two years. Um, so you're able to perform, um, to be a part of labor and delivery, but you're also able to do well woman gynecology care, uh, which is anything from puberty to menopause with any female gendered or female part having individual. Name's Professor Tang Simmons. I'm one of the faculty in the Diagnostic Medical Imaging Department. Um, in our school, we teach ultrasound to students. Ultrasound is a type of uh, methodology for looking inside bodies by utilizing sound. Um, primarily, most people know it because we look at pregnancies, we evaluate pregnancies and fetals, fetuses by using this, um, but we can also use it to look at the heart, we look at the blood vessels, we look at muscles, uh, we even look at brains um, from time to time. So it's a really interesting uh, field, especially if you like being a detective, if you like working with science, if you like working with computers, this would probably be the one for you. Hi everyone, so uh, PT is, uh, you know, just the field of helping uh, patients recover from an injury. Uh, we deal mostly with musculoskeletal issues. Um, orthopedics is the main and most popular field, but there's other branches of PT, um, such as neuro, cardiovascular, uh, and cardiopulm, and integumentary. Um, and as I had spoken earlier, those fields are slightly different, uh, but that, you know, as when you graduate from PT school, you're gonna be considered a physical therapist, and then you can choose to specialize in any one of those fields depending on you know, what really what your interests are. Uh. One of the biggest things that attracted all of us to PT is the amount of quality time you could spend with your patient. Like Jose was saying earlier, there's so much more than just fixing the patient. You know, we're making the mechanical environment conducive to healing, but also you're getting to know this patient, you're getting to know their personalities, and you become a huge advocate for them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, <are> we, <laughs> just to sum everything up, uh, Physical therapy is a very involved field. It's a, a field that requires you to be involved in these patients' lives, you know? Uh, and that may seem like a big responsibility, uh, but it's what sets us apart from, I would say, other medical careers, uh, because we're, we get to know them in a basis that other medical professions don't. 
we're there with, with them so many so many times. And when you help someone get better and you're there with them throughout the whole process, you know, sometimes they tend to cling on you and they tend to trust in you more. Uh, and so that's what we want to do. Like Christine said, we want to prepare a good mechanical environment, meaning that we want to give them the right exercises, the right uh, modalities such as ice, heat, to get them better. But we also want to encourage, you know, their mental health and we also want to encourage their emotional health, which ultimately will bring everything together and they can go back into everyday life. So we're going to commence with the rest of the program. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have presentations from faculty members and different people from um, SUNY Downstate's CHIRP and the School of Public Health. And you got a chance to uh, get a little bit of information upstairs and speak to some of the students, I hope, and get a little bit of a student's side of what life like is in PE school, midwifery school, occupational therapy, and in, in public health, a little bit of that. So what we like to see is, how many of you really, really like the sciences? Show of hands. Okay, how about technology? Engineering? And what about math? Uh, <laughs> it's good. I like to see so many girls' hands go up for math. Um, I don't know, you probably have heard this terminology STEM before, science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. It's rich in, in, in information and very, very important for young people now to really focus on these areas, especially when you're thinking about going into a health-related career. The science has become very, very important. And men, over the years, we've started to notice that a lot of men are not getting into the health-related professions as much as they used to years ago. So when I look around the room, I see a lot of ladies, which is really great because we're breaking that glass ceiling. Yay for the ladies. <laughs> All right, but we like to see a lot of men. So when you leave here today, don't just go home and just really think about it yourself, but talk to your friends your cousins, your other family members, talk to them about the opportunities that are available for them here in SUNY Downstate and in health-related careers. So without any further ado, we're gonna start off today with our presentations with physical therapy. And Durain, uh, Lorraine Antoine is gonna come up. She's the Director of Clinical Education from the PT program. So, Lorraine Antoine, where are you? Oh, there you are. Good afternoon, everybody. So this is pretty nice. I actually lived in the neighborhood and had no idea about physical therapy program here at Downstate and found out when I did a Google search way back in my college days. And that's how I learned to apply here. I'm actually a graduate from Downstate as well. So if I had something like this, it would have definitely helped me considering that I was in the STEP program, which is Science and Technology Entry Program via LI, Long Island University. Um, so. It was, pretty, it was pretty cool. It was something where we got to do a lot of sciences. We did verbal. I got to dissect things and math all while in high school at a college campus. So it really prepped me for the college experience. So in regards to um, talking about the STEM program, it's really good if you research a lot of these programs ahead of time because they only help you and they're usually free. So this is a great program that you're here today. And as soon as we get the... PowerPoint work, and I'll talk a little bit about physical therapy. There we go. See, right on cue. <laughs> All right. So the physical, how many of you know what physical therapy is? Almost as much hands as math, so I'm all happy about that. Okay, so physical therapy, how many of you have had physical therapy or know someone that's had physical therapy? All right, good. So as you can see here, we're the hands-on care and health profession. Not that the others aren't, but we spend a lot of time with our patients. So I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I get asked a lot, why don't you go to medical school? And one of the things that I love the most is that I get to know and spend time with my patients. Physical therapy is usually top three, if not number one, of job satisfaction of all jobs in the country. So we love what we do. Why? Because we make a difference. So with physical therapy, we're Usually it's not always a good thing when you have to get physical therapy, right? That means there's some kind of injury or something's going on in your life or in your family member's life in which they have to partake in physical therapy. What we do is we diagnose and manage what may be going on. So if anyone can have physical therapy. So we treat from babies 
all the way up to elderly. So that means we see everything in between. So we see the babies, the toddlers, the children, we see the young adults, we see the elderly. And what we do is we promote wellness and fitness as well as we prevent the onset and progression of impairments, functional limitations, and disabilities. We do this by using a clinical decision making and we do an actual physical exam in which we talk to our patients and we do test and measures, all kinds of fun things in order to figure out what's going on and to give us our di diagnosis. We then talk to our patients, we say, listen, this is what's going on, this is how we can help you, and this is what we expect the results of what we're gonna do for you to, to be. And we do that via intervention. So for those of you who have had physical therapy, was it fun? <laughs> At the end it was fun, right? When it, once it was done. And the reason for that is we have to do things that may not feel good, but what we do overall is get you to your, your goal. So we do things, whether it's cardiopulmonary, we do neuromuscular, we do musculoskeletal and integumentary. So all that means is we treat the body. Just about any part of the body, we treat it. So we do that in many different ways. So for those of you who had physical therapy, I hope you were touched, which means that your therapist did what we call manual therapy, which is hands-on. So whether it's massage, as some people like to call it, or it's mobilization, so moving the joints in the body, we do that hands-on as well as using exercise. Sometimes you see a little child in physical therapy and you think they're playing, but they're actually doing what we call therapeutic exercise. We have all kinds of machines that can help us, whether it's EMG, which we hook up the muscle to the muscles, whether it's ultrasound. So we have different, what we call modalities to also help in healing. And then we also can help you with equipment. So if you need braces, wheelchairs, things of that nature, we can also assist in getting you what you need. So, you can become a physical therapist after three years of school. You now become a doctor of physical therapy, so you'll be Dr. Blank. And you can also become specialized. So the specialization is a board certified exam. So if, for example, I love working in orthopedics. If I love working in orthopedics and I want everyone to know that I am specialized in this, I can become an orthopedic specialized therapist. But you can also do that for cardiovascular, you can do it for clinical electrophysiology, geriatrics, pediatrics, and even sports. So who, has phys who gets physical therapy? I talked about the age range, right? Do you have a question? You've had physical therapy. That's, and it helped you, I'm hoping, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> it should have helped you. <laughs> but what it does is anyone in, the, anyone in your environment can have physical therapy. And anyone, and there are a lot of people who has had physical therapy that you may know and may not know. And today you might have found out some of your classmates did. And the reason for that is, like I said, we treat the body. So we can treat someone that's overstressed at work that has neck pain from it. We can treat a woman who's pregnant. We can treat anyone. Why would a pregnant, so the question is, why would a pregnant, need phys, pregnant woman need physical therapy? Many different reasons. So what happens is, when you go to physical therapy, there's always a chief complaint, meaning a problem. What's wrong? Why did you come here today? So reasons why I've treated pregnant women in the past came from low back pain, right? They have a pretty heavy load that they're carrying now. It can be from knee pain, which can be also due to the increased weight of having the baby. And there are many different reasons, so it varies. There's also gestational diabetes. There are so many different causes of things that can occur, a herniated disc, that really, it just depends on what the chief complaint is. So that question can be asked for anybody, right? Why would you need physical therapy? And the question is, what is your chief complaint? And if you have a chief complaint, and my job is to sit with you, diagnose why you're having that chief complaint, and then make you better. So that's our goal as physical therapists. So honestly, anyone may need physical therapy. And our goal is to find out if it's medical necessary. And if it is, then we're going to treat you. So that's a good question. But 
other people. So we could have infants with a birth defect. We treat athletes, right? Uh, many of you who watch sports, you've seen all the athletes, whether it's the bone going through the leg or concussion or back injuries, we treat all of those patients. The great part about being a physical therapist is there's so much flexibility. If you name it, we're there. So whether it's a school system, whether it's the hospitals, whether it's home care, going to the house, whether it's at a nursing facility, whether it's at an outpatient private practice, we can work in universities, we teach. So we're everywhere. And that flexibility is huge because a lot of people, when they start families, they need that flexibility in their schedules. And physical therapy is one field where if you take some time off, you can come back and still be current because we do have continuing education courses. So it's a great field because of the flexibility. So for example, I'm a professor, full-time professor here and a director of clinical education, but I also have my own private practice where I treat patients and have physical therapists that treat patients. And I also have little kids. So you can do it all and be a physical therapist. So what does it take to be a physical therapist? So this, this is a little long, but I'm just gonna give you the overall. So you're gonna go to the school, like I said, for three years. So how do you get to physical therapy school? You start where you are now in high school. You take as many sciences, you get prepped on the math, you really get into your education, because once you get to college, you're gonna have to take specific courses that are all listed here that I'm not gonna go through, <laughs> um, that you're gonna have to take, such as anatomy, physiology, and many other things that some of the physical therapy students have spoken to you about. But one of the things about downstate in particular is that we have what we call a bachelor's and doctorate program, which means you don't have to graduate college to come to our grad school. You will, your first year will be part of your bachelor's, so for many students what that means is if you can get these prerequisites done, within your first three years of college, you save one year of tuition because now you're in your grad school here and you finish it. So you can do the program in six years. So what does that take? Planning. So that means when you're here now and you hear about all these programs, is physical therapy something that you're interested in, then you can start to look and research, what do I need to become a physical therapist? So that when you go to college, you can prep so that you can take these courses within your first three years to save that extra tuition. And it is also a state school, so you're paying at the SUNY rate. Once you take your license and exam of physical therapy, that's it, you're licensed. We do have a continuing education courses mandated by the New York State, but we like to do that anyway because it's fun and keeps us up to date. So I'm not gonna go through all the requirements, but I do want you guys to know that physical therapy is a field in which I love, and like I said, Many of us love it because we're all happy <laughs> compared to some of our colleagues in the medical field. And any questions? No? Good. Hopefully because now you're all excited to become physical therapists. <laughs>
Um, I was too intimidated to become a doctor. So when I looked into other health careers, I did choose ultrasound because it was kind of a marriage between healthcare and medicine and helping people and also working with computers and technology all day long. So this is for people who like to work with technology. You have to like to be, you have to be a people person. You have to work, like to work with people. You have to be very well versed in your anatomy and your physiology of all the different parts of the body um, and understanding how the, your insides work. And then based on why the patient comes in and what you're seeing on the screen, you can help figure out this puzzle of why they're in pain or why the doctor feels a bump under their skin or why their blood test came out a little wacky and you help to solve the, the puzzle or the diagnosis. Um, so if this sounds like something that you're interested in doing, you might think of becoming a diagnostic medical sonographer. That is what we are called. Um, right here, right here behind this lady, you can see this is an ultrasound machine. They come in all shapes, sizes. You have many portable ones that you can pack in your briefcase and take to doctor's offices every day. Um, and these are all transducers. A transducer is also called a probe, and that's the actual part of the machine. The one side of it gets plugged into the machine, one, and the other side is the part that actually touches your body. Um, I'm sure you've seen an ultrasound, like on Grey's Anatomy at least, right, where they put gel on, right, and they're smushing and making a big mess. That's what we do. We make a mess, and we take pictures. Um, what is ultrasound? Anybody want to take a guess? Right, so she said it's a picture of whatever's inside your stomach. So that's half credit, that's sonography. And uh, the word ultrasound, that's the next question. The word ultrasound, ultra means above, and sound is sound. So ultrasound is sound waves that are above the frequency of human hearing. So when I explain this to my students, I give the example of like a dog whistle. You know, the trainers, they blow that little whistle, that, that very, very high, ringy sound that really only dogs could hear, because they can hear at a higher frequency than we can. So sonography, ultrasound, is we sent those little probes that we put on the patient's body, it's, sending, it's not sending in radiation, it's not like x-ray. It's very safe, it's just sending in a bunch of sound waves into the patient's body at different frequencies, but there's such high frequencies that we can't hear it. Sonography is, sono means sound, graph means picture. So sonography is taking pictures using sound. Um, so here's just a little graphic. Here's again the transducer. This is a picture of somebody taking a sonogram of a patient's heart. That's called an echocardiogram. Anybody ever hear of that? An echocardiogram is a sonogram of a heart. Yes? Hemorrhage? Mm -hmm. They can't be saying like in the emergency room. The question is what happens if somebody's bleeding internally? What kind of imaging do they use? So the first in the emergency room now, it's a very good question. Um, right now, there's actually a very pretty new form of ultrasound. It's called POCUS, like Hocus Pocus. POCUS stands for Point of Care Ultrasound. When you go to the emergency room and there's a car accident and they're worried that somebody's spleen ruptured and they're bleeding, um, the first thing they'll do is whip out an ultrasound machine. And, ultras and ER residents and doctors are trained to take, it's called, they're called fast ultrasounds or POCUS ultrasounds. Sorry. Um, what that does is they're trained to take like four to six pictures to look for fluid, fluid or any kind of liquid like blood within the body to see if there is a bleed. So ultrasound is going to be the first modality that they're going to go to because it's safe. It, there's, no radi there's no radiation. Um, you don't have to stick needles in. It's not, that means it's, that's called non-invasive. You don't have to invade the body with needles or pokey things. Um, and it's the, the least expensive imaging modality. So the insurance companies love ultrasound. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, so we send, in an, we send in sound waves into the body. It hits an organ. In this picture, it's the heart. And depending on what it hits, whether it's soft tissue, soft tissue just means an organ, like liver, kidneys, the heart, the gallbladder, right? 
or it can hit bone, air, like the lungs, um, fluid, like blood, uh, water, if you just drink something, urine, whatever it hits, based on what it hits, every object that it hits is going to have a different consistency. So either the sound wave will get absorbed and kind of get lost, that usually happens with fluid, and then, or it can kind of hit something hard like a bone and then bounce right back. So if it gets absorbed, um, you know about photography and pixels, this is 2018, everyone knows what pixels are, right? Little dots on the screen on your picture, like on your phone, and all the little dots combined make up a picture. So ultrasound works the same way. Every sound wave, there's like about, there's thousands of sound waves that get put into the body. Every sound wave hits an organ or a structure and it bounces right back. And based on what it hits, it bounces back an object in various shades of gray. If it hits fluid, it'll bounce back a black dot. If it hits bone, it's, it'll ping pong right back, so it hits back bright white. Anything in between is specific shades of gray depending on how dense the actual organ or whatever it's being hit is. And then all these pixels create a picture, like a regular, you know, like our phones, right? Um, here's again different just ideas of what ultrasound machines look like. This is a more portable one that you can carry around um, I actually worked in a portable ultrasound company for four years. I had a machine in my trunk, and every Monday I went to Queens, and every Tuesday I was in Brooklyn, Thursdays I was in Manhattan, and I had my accounts, and that's where I went. And um, it was very good for the patients because they didn't have to go to some scary imaging lab center that they're, they weren't familiar with. They just came to their doctor's office, and they had the, the you know, sonogram lady was there, which was me. <laughs> so I used a machine that looked similar to this. Um, this is just... For those of you who like physics, this is what a, a transducer is made out of. And we, there is actually something called sonographic physics, which we teach you here in this program, about exactly how and why the transducer works the way it does in order to get that image. These are different kinds of transducers, which we teach you here, depending on what the patient is coming in for, what kind of exam. We use a different shape transducer different, with different frequencies, higher frequencies, lower frequencies, and we teach you all of that here in order to get the best possible picture for the best possible diagnosis. So has anybody ever had an ultrasound? So sonograms used to be more, thank you, more for babies, right? We all heard about everyone, you know, pregnant women, they get, we call it jelly on the belly and they get uh, pictures of their baby. They want to see if they're having a boy or a girl. It's very cute, right? Um, then it became popular in the, in the cardiology community with hearts. Um, you can actually see the heart pumping on the screen in real time. It's not just a picture. It's a video. You're just kind of taking a video for 20 minutes of the heart to make sure there's no leaks. But over the past, I would say, 15 years, everybody, every part of the body is being, I guess, sonogrammed, if that's a word, ultrasounded, <laughs> scanned. Um, so we can evaluate anatomy. We want to look for diseases. If somebody comes in with blood levels that were increased, uh, we check for that organs. If the, if the liver blood tests come back abnormal, we check the liver, the gallbladder. If pancreas blood work comes back abnormal, we're going to check the pancreas. Um, we can find tumors. We can find um, cysts, which are not as scary tumors. Um, we can help the doctor figure out why a patient is in pain. We can actually see blood moving in the body. So here I just put up here some pictures of different types of ultrasound. Anybody want to guess what this is? Heart. This is a heart. And this is what an echocardiogram looks like, or an echo. This is an ultrasound of the heart. You can see the four chambers of the heart. And this color is called color Doppler, which just detects which direction the blood is flowing. In this picture, red means the blood is flowing this way, and blue means the blood is flowing that way. And we teach all that to you. It's not as hard as it looks. Um, this is arteries and veins. Anybody ever hear of the carotid artery? Right in the neck. Or the arteries in the arms and the legs. We check to make sure that um, the blood is not going too quickly or there's no blockage, because if there's a blockage, that can lead to a stroke, especially in the carotid artery. This is an abdominal ultrasound. The picture up here is actually liver 
This gray area is liver, and this interesting looking area here is the kidney. And it's exactly how it's situated in the body. Well, here you don't see kidney, but this is liver. Okay, and this is um, a sonographer taking an abdominal ultrasound on this patient. That's exactly how it looks. And obstetrics and gynecology, those are the babies, right? Everybody loves the baby pictures. Um, this is a 3D ultrasound with some baby sucking on his toes. And here's our regular, we call this 2D ultrasound that we normally take. 3D is still, it's not new. It's been around for 20 years already, I would say. But the old-fashioned 2D way, we find that for, di for diagnosis, if you're looking to see if the baby's going to have some kind of birth defect, 2D is still our favorite way of diagnosing. But 3D is cute, and then they can charge you more money if you want a 3D picture of your baby. Okay, the newer one, the newest, very newest ultrasound um, technique is called musculoskeletal. Uh, muscles usually were, used to be saved for MRI and the physical therapy people. Lorraine left. Um, but um, it's a brand new, you know, we also have board certification in all the ultrasound world. It's called a registry. And they just came out last year with a brand new registry just for musculoskeletal ultrasound, especially in sports medicine. So for those of you who are sports fans and you know all your football players that get injured, right, and they still get paid their millions of dollars even if they don't play for half the season, when they're going for their surgeries and their physical therapy, part of the, part of the way they diagnose what ripped or what tore in their ligaments or tendons is by taking a musculoskeletal ultrasound. This transducer, it's teeny weeny. We call it a hockey stick transducer kind of like for the sports, but really because it looks like a hockey stick. Okay, so how do we become a sonographer? You come here. Um, our program is a bachelor's program, so that means um, you would take your freshman and sophomore years of college in any other accredited college. Um, there is um, a colorful paper in your folder about um, the Diagnostic Medical Imaging Program where it lists all of the prerequisite courses that you would need to take in your college before you get here. Once you've earned your 60 credits in your two years of college, you would transfer the credits here and complete your junior and senior years here and then graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Diagnostic Medical Imaging. Um, our program was established in 1972. We are the first bachelor degree program in ultrasound in the country. Um, we're very proud about that, maybe a little snooty, but we're proud. Um, and our program is two years with one summer in between. So it's fall, spring, summer, and then another fall, spring. So it's not quite 24 months. It's just shy of two years, and you get a bachelor's. Um, students have five clinical rotations. There's five semesters. Half the time you're going to be in class. Half the time you're going to be out at the hospitals training. You get five different rotations. You get five different specialties. One semester, you'll be taking sonograms of babies. One, you'll do heart. One, you'll do abdominal. And that's my job here. I have to track where the students have been and what specialty they still need. So you really get a full range of all different kinds of ultrasound once you're in our program. Um, we always have to work under the direction of a doctor, like even if we were to open up our own clinic, the uh, doctor actually, it's called reading the sonogram. Even though we know what we're looking at for malpractice insurance purposes and training, doctors officially have to read the sonogram and diagnose it, and then they send the results to the, to the patient's original doctor who sent them for the ultrasound. The doctors who read ultrasounds are called radiologists. Um, cardiologists can read ultrasounds, they're, they're, they're echoes. Um, sometimes you have the baby doctors, perinatologists who read um, the baby, the OB ultrasounds. Um, and our graduates, even before you graduate, you're eligible to sit for our national board. So you can be a registered sonographer before you graduate. And the, so the minute you graduate, we have three students who are not coming to graduation because they already got jobs and they can't take off because it's their first week. So... You can really, we train you really, really hard here so that um, you have enough clinical hours and you have enough classroom hours to be able to be eligible to take this exam. So, okay. 
there's this is just a short list of all the different kinds of registry certifications you could take. It says physics up here. This is not torques and vectors. You do not need a calculator. This is sonographic physics. Uh, no matter what specialty you decide to, you can specialize in all of them. I have three certifications. I have colleagues who have four. One of our students are taking seven. Um, but the most common ones are here, listed here. But no matter what you specialize in, you, you also have to pass the physics component. Physics is just teaching you how the ultrasound machine works how you get the nicest picture, why you get the nicest picture, if you find a disease, what buttons you can push to make the picture nicer and why it works. Our students have a, a, pass, a national pass rate of over 90%, which is higher than the, reg than the rest of the, of the country. So um, we really prepare you well. Um, if you take your abdominal or OBGYN registry, you become a registered diagnostic medical sonographer, and these are the letters that you get after your name. If you take the vascular one, that's the arteries and veins, you become a registered vascular technologist, and those are the, this is the, these are the letters you get after your name. And if you take any echo, whether it's adult, pediatric, or fetal, there's three different exams. You can take one or all three. Either one, you, get, you become a registered diagnostic cardiac sonographer, RDCS. So I have abdominal, OBGYN, and cardiac. It was fun. <laughs> so what, where could you work when you're a sonographer? Most commonly in the hospitals. Um, hospitals pay a little bit less, but they have amazing benefits package, which to high schoolers, you just want to make a lot of money, so you don't really care that much about benefits. But benefits means good health insurance, good pension, so when we're old, we don't have to work anymore. The government will just pay us. That's pretty much what it means. Um, you can also work in private doctor's offices in a mobile company like I used to work in. Um, there's no school for ultrasound of animals, like veterinary ultrasound, but if you have a pet and you've been to the vet, um, there are sonographers there. It's the same principles and theory, um, and you can, if you're a, a pet lover, you can train in veterinary sonography if you want to work in an animal shelter. Um, you can also help design the machines. You can also help sell the machines. You can, they do this in the military. And when astronauts go into space, they send up a mini portable s ultrasound machine in case somebody gets sick up there. They want to see what's wrong with them. So if you want to work in with NASA, you can be a sonographer. Um, salaries in New York City, we start in the mid 50s to low 60s range, 60,000. And here is our program information. The most important number is this one. That's our Diagnostic Medical Imaging main office line if you're interested in hearing more about our program. But everything you need to know is in that little colored paper in your folder. And that is all. Any questions? Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Rivka. So I understand that, um, which school is this over here? Okay, some students have had to depart a little earlier. Let me just give you, you want the um, So we thank you so much for coming. And I just want to remind you, in your bags there's a survey. Make sure you fill the survey out. Okay, you, they did? We're, um, Dr. Desport, they're asking where to hand in their surveys. Okay, Mr. Bones. You're so very welcome. We're glad to have you. I have Dr. Karen Banker here. She is an associate dean in the School of Public Health. And earlier you met Mr. Rashid. He's going to come and he's actually a student in the program. Oh, I'm sorry. I am corrected. He is actually a graduate from the program. So he's going to come and talk to you a little bit more about it. So without any further ado, Dr. Karen Banker. Thank you very much. So um, public health is a very broad field, but as an example of public health that has always inspired me, it's the work that Mrs. Cursant and Tiffany's grandmother did several uh, decades ago in which they set the standards, they created the services, 
that Haitian immigrants and refugees who were at risk uh, for HIV uh, or had HIV who were being kept in jails in, Gua in um, Guantanamo to help those people come here, get integrated into the life of New York City and to get treatment for HIV. It was a tremendous uh, example of what public health could do in terms of health equity. So I always um, have to say that um, Mrs. Crisanda has been one of my um, uh, champions, people that I really admire. Um, so um, I think, how many of you remember the Zika epidemic of a few years ago, right? And um, this very, very tragic uh, epidemic of babies being born with very tiny brains. And this was a complete mystery, uh, 4,000 babies in the world were born this way. Uh, luckily, only 51 of them were in the United States. But the cause of this was a virus that um, was c very unusual, and it just happened that at the uh, time of the Olympics in Brazil, this virus, was, because a lot of people came to the, presumably to the Olympics from around the world, that in the past Zika was known, but it only, it, it was sort of like a little rash that adults would get, or grown, or children that were growing up, and you know, after a while it would go away. But what happened in Brazil, what, and there was this very, very broad um, uh, ex uh, spread of Zika, um, pregnant women who contracted Zika were at very high risk of having a baby born with this very sad um, uh, uh, deformity. And uh, many of these children only live for months or uh, a few years. This epidemic was studied and stopped by epidemiologists. They realized that what was happening was that the virus was being spread by a specific mosquito. And if pregnant women could, and this mosquito can be eradicated, you know, spray, sprays in different areas. That's why in the, and it, the, this particular mosquito especially likes tropical areas. That's why the few babies that were born in the United States were in southern Florida where this uh, particular mosquito was able to sort of uh, spread a little bit. But the epidemiologist from uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease uh, Control in, uh, in the United States, worked with, again, colleagues from all around the world to figure out how to get rid of this mosquito and how to prevent the, the uh, spread of this epidemic. The epidemic was stopped, and we do not see those that deformity anymore in babies. Um, and that's great, right? So an epidemiologist might be a person who's working with data, you know, uh, analyzing records. It might be an epidemiologist who's trekking through the swamp, collecting different uh, mosquito larvae. I mean, there's a tremendous variety in uh, work in that field. Here's another public health issue that's um, unfortunately uh, fairly prevalent in Brooklyn and in Manhattan and the Bronx and uh, other places. Now, these are older women who have been trafficked, but we know that <coughs> trafficking victims uh, tend to be first recruited about the age of 12 to 14. And this happens on the streets of New York. Um, and there are regular arrests for the people who are trafficking these uh, children. Um, and this is just something that's uh, so abhorrent, so, uh, so wrong and so destructive. Um, one thing that community health professionals did was to fight, help the, in the fight to change the law. Originally, 
if a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old, 15, 16-year-old was actually being trafficked, was being forced to walk up and down underneath the uh, elevated train or in certain areas of uh, certain boroughs um, and was caught uh, being forced to s sell sex to um, usually a middle-aged man who comes in a car, the 12-year-old would be arrested and sent away with a sharp uh, lecture to improve her morals. Now this, at that, in New York State, you have to be 17 or older to consent to sex. So this was not, uh, this was in fact statutory rape, but the buyer of sex was just let go. And the child was, a, now it took a tremendous amount of fight back to get that change and so that the men now who are buying sex are sentenced. <coughs> And the uh, girls who are obviously eager to escape from this life, we now have programs that help not only give these young women a chance to uh, develop their normal uh, desires in life, but also um, we're, we're realizing that the girls who get kind of tricked into this uh, initially are one of the big risk factors is that they may have been sexually abused in the home or forced to home or s somewhere else. And so now our faculty here and with the help of students are doing what's called resistance training in uh, uh, especially girls in high school so that they have a chance to see another way of handling the, the issues in their life that can be uh, difficult. And we've also learned that it's not unusual for the mother of these girls to herself have also been uh, sexually abused as a child. And so uh, working with mothers who have, of teenage daughters has also helped stop this very um, criminal activity involving uh, uh, young girls. This also happens with boys. It's a somewhat different pattern, but... Um, um, this is another major issue in the United States. We're the only developed country that doesn't have health care for everyone. Now, um, this is uh, 20 years ago. Um, you can see that uh, uh, over 16% of people in the United States had no health insurance. So what does that mean that to have no health insurance? It means if you're pregnant, you can't afford to go for prenatal care. If you uh, throw your back out on the job, uh, you just live with the pain. If you've got a, if your gallbladder is about to burst, you just hope it doesn't burst. So um, uh, people went through a lot of unnecessary uh, suffering. They died early from high blood pressure and diabetes that could be treated. I'll, I'll get your question in a second. but. Something happened in uh, 20, uh, 2010 and 12. Uh, does anybody uh, know what that was? Obamacare. Exactly. Obamacare came in that uh, made it possible for more and more people to uh, get health insurance. And um, the way that happened, part of it was the role of uh, public health policy professionals who could go to employers and say, you know, if everybody had health insurance, uh, you wouldn't have to pay so much health insurance for your employees, and your employees would be healthier and work better, and would go to the insurance companies and say, you know, if everybody had health insurance, you would be making more money. <laughs> Uh, and, and yet you would be able to charge less to everyone. So it wasn't, so one of the things about policy people, they have to figure out what's gonna influence this group of stakeholders, what's gonna introduce th that group of stakeholders. Um, so um, one of the things we always have to know is what med medicine is the best and the way we do that is by having biostatisticians analyze the data. Does, 
is for this particular cancer, is it group uh, drug A that's better or drug B? And uh, this is, all of these are great um, jobs going forward. Uh, another public health issue is global warming. Uh, the polar bears are dying because the, the polar ice cap is, um, is uh, dissolving uh, and the warmest areas of the world are becoming uh, uh, unlivable for, uh, for animals and that's why we have environmental health scientists working to deal with these things. So all of these are uh, careers, areas that you could go in after you graduate from uh, college and when you're ready, we're here for you. This is our new building that you see in the front. And thank you so much for that. Tayyip's going to uh, make a few remarks. Hello, everyone, again. Um, so I don't have a slide. I'm just going to talk to you about uh, sort of the student experience and why I came to public health. Uh, so Dr. Banker was one of my um, uh, advisors, mentors, professors, and she really got me thinking about what I'd want to do in a career in public health. So generally, uh, we like to say that public health works in countless ways to make our world better. It really connects all of us, and um, it promotes and protects the communities that people live, you know, learn, work, and play in. And um, so sorry to like illustrate that point. She, she went into very specific examples, but if you want to take a look at a general perspective, uh, so when a um, doctor goes and he treats, he or she treats uh, disease and injury, and um, as public health professionals, we find out what's the cause and sort of find a solution to prevent disease and injury. So we want to do something of a, something with a larger impact for everyone. And that's sort of what really caught my attention to public health. Uh, I wanted to do something where it had a big impact, and so that's uh, why I pursued a master's in public health. Um, so again, some more specific examples that uh, you might be interested in uh, might be promoting policies in protecting the global environment, like global health. Um, and so with global health, you know, um, uh, sorry, global, the global environment, you uh, need to understand that there's a link between all of us and it, anything, um, any health issues can tr uh, go out of borders. So that's important. Or um, another thing that's more recent in the news is um, identifying ways to curb bullying in schools. Um, and then how many of you believe in social justice? Yes? Not everyone? Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, um, so one way uh, we c that that relates to public health is sor sort of exploring how human rights violations impact um, poor health outcomes. And there is a connection with that, and people explore that. So, um, just a, so currently right now, um, after I graduated from the School of Public Health, I uh, now work at the president's office as his administrative fellow working on various projects to not only advance SUNY Downstate but also advance the community and community outreach and engagement is very important and um, if you do the master's program here you'll definitely get a taste of that and I think that's one of the things that's very um, critical in the education that I received here um, and so you know, I just really want to encourage you all to take a look at what there is, to, uh, what possibilities are in the field of public health, and that, uh, um, you know, if you're interested in PT, OT, PAs, uh, physician's assistants, occupational therapists, physical therapists, any of the careers that you've seen today, public health is a great complement to that. It really widens your scope of how you, uh, how you go ahead and heal others. Um, so I hope you all have a great rest of the day and are inspired to uh, explore careers in healthcare. Thank you, Rashid. All right. Thank you, Dr. Banker, for coming. So after you have, your, have had your pizza, what usually ends up happening is people end up getting that itis thing. So. I want to encourage you to speak up. I see a hand over there. Who has a question? You have a question? Yes, we have a mic. Here's a mic. Oh, 
Mr. Bones will come around if you have a question about something, and I'll do my best to answer it. In a And I hope I can answer it. <laughs> um, hello. Um, so, like, I wanted to ask, like, when people are pregnant, when women, women hold the mic to your hand. I can. When hear they're you. pregnant, um, they like always have like diabetes. Like, do they always yeah, what? Yeah, that's true. When they're pregnant, they like some. Yeah, some. Some women have like. Excuse me. Some women have like diabetes when they're pregnant. Yes. Why? It's called gestational diabetes. Right. Well, it depends on a lot of things. Diabetes is basically a genetic um, disease. Um, some women don't have diabetes until they become pregnant. Um, and it's just a, it's a phenomenon that happens. We don't really exactly know what causes the pancreas, which is an organ within your body, that stops producing insulin. They haven't really come up with the reason for why that is. But when a woman gets pregnant and if she ends up getting diabetes during the time she's pregnant, that's called gestational diabetes. It often goes away after they give birth, but then once that ha happens to them, they're at a higher risk for getting diabetes again. And you know, there's two types of diabetes. There's type one and type two. The type one people usually must have insulin in order to stay alive. People with type two diabetes, if they catch it early, might be able to control it with diet and exercise, but most of the time they need medications to help stay healthy. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, is another question here? Yes, and then we're gonna move along with the program after um, that. Before you're talking about stuff like with um, sports medicine and all yes. that stuff. So, do you guys do that here or it's just like the other stuff that you're talking about before? Say the last, I didn't actually, actually hear your question. Do we do what here? Um, you guys are talking about sports medicine before, so like, do you guys actually like do that here or you just? Yes. yes, we do. It really depends on which discipline that you're, you're going into. So say, for instance, if you're doing physical therapy, you see people, they play basketball, football, and they injure themselves. Well, after they injure themselves, usually they send them off on a cart and they go in the back and they get an MRI or they may get a sonogram, some sort of thing that would be diagnostic medical imaging, okay? So then after that, they have to do rehab. The rehab is the physical therapy portion. So some people get lucky and they end up working for one of the teams or something like that and they get a chance to do physical therapy for actual people who are actively doing some sort of uh, sport. And then there's occupational therapy for people who, who maybe have an accident or something. They need help with their activities, what we call daily living, how to feed themselves again, how to go up and down the stairs again, all those kinds of things. So we do do that. And in the physician assistant program, our students get an opportunity to take advantage of some electives where they can actually work with the doctor. They actually can go in and do surgeries. And we have one of our uh, PA program students here, Mr. Sharonde Jean-Baptiste, who will come up in a little while and talk to you a little bit about the student perspective from the PA program. Any more questions? All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead with my presentation. So I'm here to talk to you about physician assistants, okay? Okay, so who are physician assistants, all right? We discussed about it a little bit more. Basically, we are, excuse me, we are providers who work, generally speaking, alongside a physician. We work in what we call a team, but by no means does it mean that we have to work with a doctor all the time. In the state of New York, the law says that we can work with a doctor that we just need to be able to get in touch with. So we could be Skyping with them, we can be texting, we can be doing all different kinds of modes of communication in order to stay in touch with our doctor. They don't have to necessarily be in the room with us all the time. And as we go through my, uh, my presentation, you'll see a little bit more, so I don't wanna give it all away right now, but uh, PA is a really, really good alternative if you want to get on with being able to treat patients and do most, if not just about everything that a medical doctor does, does in a lot less time, all right? And we'll go over that a little bit more too. Okay, so without further ado, if the folks in the back are ready, we're gonna show you a very, very short video. PAs are healthcare providers who practice medicine. They can help you get well and stay well. PAs can examine, diagnose, and treat you when you get sick or injured. They can interpret your lab tests, perform procedures, and assist in surgery. They also have the authority to prescribe medication. 
Most PAs complete a three-year master's degree program that includes 2,000 hours in clinical rotations, but their training never stops. They complete 100 hours of medical education every two years and must pass a rigorous recertification exam every 10 years. On top of being nationally certified, PAs must be licensed to practice in their state. You'll find PAs in every medical specialty, from pediatrics to surgery, and every medical setting from hospitals to community health centers. America's PAs are dedicated to providing excellent care that focuses on the patient. PAs are proven to increase access to care, improve health outcomes, and elevate patient satisfaction. Visit aapa.org to learn more about PAs. Short and sweet. Somebody mentioned earlier before Obamacare, or actually it's the Affordable Care Act, has um, provisions in it very specifically uh, speaking to physician assistants and thereby increasing people's access to health care today. So I don't have to have an MD behind my name to get the same satisfaction when I tell somebody you're pregnant or your blood pressure, Mr. Johnson, is right where we need it to be. Or to be able to have to say to somebody, we're sorry, but you have so-and-so disease and we need to work on trying to help you get better. So PAs do a lot that doctors do. And without any further ado, what I think you'd like to do is hear maybe from one of our students. So I'm gonna introduce Sharon Jean baptiste up. He's doing his geriatrics rotation right now. He'll talk to you for a moment and then I'll come back and finish up my set. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Sharon Jean baptiste I'm a second year PA student at SUNY Downstate. And and uh, I'm hoping to answer any questions you guys may have about the PA program or maybe my experience as a student. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, sure. Um, um, I, I said, uh, what was the application process like for this school? Um, so, now it's a master program, so I'm guessing like you have to complete like a, a four-year undergrad, and um, after that, I also they are required to to do like a 500 community service. Um, me personally, when I was applying, um, I work in a hospital as a EMT, so that helped me to um, complete the the hours that were required. And um, I also did uh, my undergrad in biology, which also helped because like once you get in the program, it's mostly gonna be anatomy and physiology and all these good courses. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, um, so I did my associate in um, um, applied science and then uh, my uh, bachelor in biology. And then uh, also in between times, I worked as an EMT for Lenox Hill Hospital. Um, as an undergrad or here? Okay, so, so I think undergrad was like 130 um, uh, credit. Um, and here, I. I'm not sure how much classes, but uh, we had to do the anatomy, physiology, um, microbiology. We took, um, um, I think, uh, what? Right, so, okay. Um, but basically, like, uh, you're gonna take a lot of science classes and a lot of anatomy classes, which will allow you to basically understand everything that's happening in the body and also facilitate, you know, your practice as a physician assistant. What are some challenges you faced with this program? What are the challenges? Okay, so um, it's a lot of material to study for a very short period of time. So basically I was in class for my first year of PA um, I was in class like from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And uh, on top of that, I, s I had to stay till maybe like 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. to study all the materials and that was like five days a week. And also I had to come during the weekend. So 
basically it's a lot of studying, but it's very rewarding because like um, as a practicing PA or future practicing PA, like all the things that you study, you also get to see them in a you know person, like um, the person you're treating. So basically you get to practice all that knowledge and it's very rewarding. Um, my question is, they said that you have to take an exam every 10 years, right? So right. as a PA, you have to continue doing the schooling during your work? So after you graduate, you go into practice, right? Um, but medicine is something that's changing. There's a uh, better medication and better like procedures. So basically like that, Ten, like that exam that we have to retake every 10 years is just to keep up updated on the practicing of medicine because you do want to provide the best care you you can to your patient. Okay. Um, but you won't have to be in class for 10 years. If that answered the question. Out of all your classes, what was the hardest and do you think that it affected you, making you better as a PA? Um, okay, so all the classes are equally challenging, um, but uh, my hardest class, I would say anatomy and physiology, um, not anat anatomy. Why? Because it was the first class um, in PA school, and um, basically I did not know what to expect so I went in like blindly, no guidance. So I found it challenging. But um, after like, you know, a few weeks in the program or the first month, you get accustomed to the method of studying and the amount of work. So then it becomes a little bit less challenging over time. Um, but PA in general is, it's, it's challenging, but it's rewarding. You're gonna be happy um, studying. Um, you're gonna be happy like uh, learning all the medicine. You're gonna be happy, um, you know, learning the procedures. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of studying. <laughs> One more thank question. Yeah, I'll take the, thank you, Sharon. He has to get back going someplace, so I'll, the, I'll take that last question and then I want to quickly sum up so that we can get on to our last two programs. What was the last how, question? How much different is the state boards in comparison to the medical doctor and what's the starting salary? Okay, actually I'm gonna go over the salaries in my PowerPoint, but the, the state board exam is 225 questions. When you're going to medical school, you go through a whole lot more um, exams. There's your USMLE steps one, two, three, and then there's four, and then it's a whole lot more schooling. When I was doing my rotations, I remember there was a resident who didn't know anything much about PAs and said, if I had known about PA, I had done that, because the rewards are really the same. There's nothing wrong with being a doctor. Nurse practitioner is another profession that's very close to ours, but the uh, ability to move around from all these are some of the different um, things that we do as physician assistants. Okay, um, you can see um, 255 PA programs in the United States. We know all this. Um, clinical hours that you need, educated with a master's degree. You just have to have a bachelor's degree. It doesn't, ha I started, my first degree was in communications. I didn't even have a medical biology or anything like that. So as long as you have the will and the science courses and things that you need, okay? So let's take a look at that. Um, you have to get your license, of course. You get your license after you take your exam. The uh, continuing CME, like Sharandi said, is just to make sure that everybody's up to date. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, you know, this is the starting annual salary you were asking about, about 97000 and it really depends, okay? Here's some other figures about some starting salaries, okay? All right, the first program was in 1967 at Duke University. Okay, so what they do, they took these Navy corpsmen and they said, what are we gonna do with them? So they became PAs, all right? And these are some of the states. We have a very high concentration here in New York. Okay, people are very pleased with the, the PA, you know, services that they get. When you go to a lot of emergency rooms, a lot of times you, PAs are, are treating you, okay? So um, we're not just the physician's assistant, we do see patients on our own, okay? People are very happy with the outcomes, okay? Um, 
like I said, the physician does not have to be there the entire time that the PA is there. They perform, they do consultations, they do just about everything that the doctor does. Uh, and once again, it's really about high quality care. We work in all these different specialties that you can barely imagine. This is one of our classes now, they're in their scrubs. Okay, and then the Downstate PA program, what you could do is you can go on the website and you can look and see what the requirements are. All right, but basically it's seven semesters, very short considering um, what you need to do to be a, a medical doctor. They go through clerkships, okay. We're at an academic medical center here. There's a hospital attached to us, okay. This is what we're looking for. That's why I talked about sciences earlier because that's very important to get the sciences in, okay. These are the classes, yes way. <laughs> you have to take all these classes before you can apply. So if you're really thinking about doing something, even some of the other programs, PT and OT, you still need to have sciences, okay. Direct patient contact, health-related experiences are very important. We encourage people to do volunteer work, so if you like to do volunteer work now, that's something that you really want to continue to do, okay? Criminal background check, obviously is a very ethical, all of our programs here, you have to have a, be a person of good ethical and moral character, so they do do background checks here for everybody who wants to apply to our programs. And of course, you have to do a health clearance and meet standards. So your basics that you need, computer skills and things like that. So I don't know if you know it, but after you, after you go to medical school, you see people and they have on that long white coat, right? So PAs get to wear this long white coat too, right? If they're wearing a short white coat, that means they're still a student and they're trying to learn. They're still in that learning phase. But I'm glad to put my stethoscope on and my long coat on every single day and go out in the world and really help people with their health care. So think about physician assistant, all right? Good. Without any further ado then, I'm gonna move it on along to, let's see, we have OT coming up next. Yes, we have Ms. Astra Henry, who is an assistant professor with the Occupational Therapy Program. Please welcome Ms. Astra Henry. Okay, what is occupational therapy? Um, occupational therapy is the therapy that deals with anything that occupies your time from the minute you get up to the minute you go up to bed. So everything you're doing now, you're writing, you're paying attention, you're on your phone, you're sleeping. This is anything that goes wrong with that, we're the therapy that has to get you back to doing that. Um, so for regular adults, we look at things that you do during your day. You're at work, whatever you do at work, if something happens to you, we have to get you back to work. We look at children. What do the children do? They go to school. We're in schools, we help children with handwriting, with focusing, with anything that interrupts what they're doing at school. Um, we're, we work closely with physical therapists, um, but we do more specific things than um, physical therapists. So a lot of the times my patients say, I say, okay, something has happened, what do you wanna do? And they'll always tell you, I wanna walk again. And I always say, that's great, we're gonna get you walking again, we're gonna try to get you walking again, but you'll be able, will you be able to dress yourself? That's what an occupational therapist has to do. Will you be able to go to the bathroom? Will you be able to go from point A to B in your house? That's what we do. Um, so we work in many different areas. We work in schools. I work with um, five-year-olds to 14-year-olds at school. I'm a professor here. We work in hospitals. We work in rehab, nursing homes. We work in your home. So if you've had a stroke and you've been in rehab, but eventually you have to go home, an occupational therapist will come to your house to help you get situated in your house because that's where you live. So you may be able to do something in the rehab that you have to do in your house, and we need to see where everything is in your house. So we order equipment for you to be able to do things in your house. Um, now, everything I'm talking about that occupies your time is something that you, you're trying to make, you're trying to do function. So our main thing is if your functioning is affected, the occupational therapist has to assess and realize what can we do to get you back to what you were before? So now, the perks of being an occupational therapist, and there are lots of perks. Um, like all the other professions up here, we're very happy people because 
we help people. We help people every day that we go to work in some way, fashion, or form. And if you're gonna work for 40, 50 years, you want to do something that you look forward to doing every day. I've been an occupational therapist now for 20 years. I went to work this morning, I was happy. I left work, I was happy. Okay, so we have a 100% employment rate. If you are an occupational therapist and you want to work, you will work because we work in so many different settings. I'll give you a good example. Um, occupational therapists work for UPS, FedEx, because people do the same thing every day. Put them in trucks, they put them on planes, but they injure themselves all the time. So we work with companies like that to prevent injury, and let's say something does happen. We work with them to get people back to work. Now, if you wanna work part-time, you can do that. If you wanna work full-time, you can do that. If you wanna take time off, you can do that too. When you come back, you're still an occupational therapist. Um, and we get paid very well. The starting salary is about $65,000, $70,000. The therapist will make $200,000. It's whatever you want. That's what you want to do. You, you go and you make it happen in all these different settings. So now, I heard a question about what are the challenges of being an occupational therapist. And I thought about that. And the challenges, one of the main challenges is you have to motivate people to get back to how they were before and when something tragic has happened, like a stroke, like a heart attack, or um, in the case of children, where I, I work with children and I can't tie my shoes. I will make sure that you can tie your shoes by the end of the year. We have to motivate people. So here at Downstate, the requirements for you to become an occupational therapist, uh, you hear it all the, all the time, sciences, you have to do a lot of science, but you also have to do a lot of psychology because you have to motivate people. Um, we have a master's program here, it's three years, and pretty soon we're gonna have a doctorate program here, meaning you would be a doctor of occupational therapy, but your training here at Downstate starts with gross anatomy. And um, the student that was here before, I heard you have to study a lot, gross anatomy, is an amazing class to start with because you get to learn the human body from the skin to the bones. And some people are like, oh, no, no, no. But if you're gonna treat people, you need to know about people and what they look like from hair to the inside. So gross anatomy starts it. There are lots of um, projects, lots of papers, all geared for you to understand about people and how they function and how they do things every day. Okay, so you've done this two years, three years, and now you take a board exam. And then, yeah, we all have board exams because we're all professionals. And Downstate has one of the highest pass rates in the country, in the world. If you want to pass your exam, you come to Downstate and you study here. You have a, a, a a prep class that everybody in the world comes here to actually do to pass the exams in New York. Um, and let me see, I think I'm at 90 minutes, okay. Um, I just wanted to talk about occupational therapy versus physical therapy. We get this question a lot. We work with the whole body. We do all, we work in the same different settings and we work alongside physical therapists and we love I, both of us, uh, both um, professions really love what we do, but there's a slight difference, and if you want to know the difference, you go on the website, I'm right here, you can ask me any question. So, that was occupational therapy in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shetra. We're running a little short on time, so we're gonna have midwifery uh, come up and they're gonna just talk very quickly. Um, we have uh, two students, um, Ronika Bennett and Sarah Lee Lewis, and then after that, we're gonna have Addie Jumbo, who's the clinical coordinator for the medical informatic, uh, inf um, informatics department. Hi everybody, my name is Sarah Lee Lewis. Um, I'm a midwifery student here and I'm in my second year. Hi, I'm Ronika Bennett and I'm in her class. All right, so we're gonna, <laughs> Thank you guys. We're gonna give you five minutes worth of midwifery. So, what are we? 
Um, we provide care to women across the spectrum, um, basically from puberty um, to menopause plus. Um, we take care of um, women in terms of any GYN care they need, gynecological care. Um, that means we provide um, contraceptives, we provide anything that they need um, in terms of their lady parts. And then um, we also care for women during pregnancy, um, birth, labor, and, and the postpartum period, as well as neonates. That means from the minute they're born to 30 days after they're born. Um, so midwives can work in a bunch of places. Can anybody tell me where, any, any ideas? You have any idea where midwife can work? Yeah? Yes, we can work at home, anywhere else? Yes, we can work in hosp hospitals. It's a common misconception that midwives, oh, they're gonna deliver your baby at home and that's it. But you actually probably have seen midwives in hospitals, in birth centers. You, I don't know if you've been to a birth center, but it might be a good idea for you to try to visit one. Um, we also work in private practice. We work with physicians and without them. We can practice independently. We can prescribe on our own as well. And we can own our own practice and open our own birth center as well. So you can have your own practice or you can just have a, you can have a birth center out of your own. It's a bigger facility, so that's of choice. And Veronica said um, that we're independent practitioners, which means that we can see patients from um, the minute they come in to the, when they give birth and no doctor has to be involved, although we do work hand in hand with physicians and they do step in when um, there are complications and stuff like that. And we need to know when to ask them to step in. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, ladies, and we're so glad that um, we still have a few of you um, left to get the last of this program here. So um, without any further ado, clinical coordinator for the medical informatics department, Dr. Um, Addie Jumbo. Hi, how's, how's everyone doing? I know you, can, you guys are kind of tired. My name is Dr. Adeboye Jumbo. I'm sort of a unique um, kind of person standing here today because I used to be a student here too. I graduated from medical informatics program in 2011. And after that, I went to Rutgers to do my PhD in biomedical informatics. Have anyone heard anything about medical informatics or even biomedical informatics? And do you know anything about that? Anyone? Any, have you heard anything about medical informatics? Have you heard anything about computer? iPod, iPhones, all the cool stuff, right? Have you heard anything about electronic medical record? What, what is it used for? Okay, what is it used for? Electronic medical record or health records system? Anyone? Maybe if you go to another hospital so that they, they will have your records easily accessed? Sure. So I'm like, yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So like in school words to relate, it could be like um, associated with like a transcript for hospital basically? Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically everyone has gone to the doctor's office, right? I would assume so. So electronic medical record is um, a system that used to capture patient information. And what we do in the medical informatics program is to assist clinicians to get the tools that they need ready. So particularly, our program is a master's degree program. What is medical informatics? An interdisciplinary, meaning that we're taking everyone that presented today, from PA to DMI, to uh, midwifery, to everyone that presented basically today, even physicians that are not here today, we are kind of helping them indirectly to provide the tools that they need to get um, patient much better and also faster to get patient healed and you know just to take care of patients. So medical informatics is a study that drives innovation that is defining the future, the future approach and knowledge management in biomedical information, clinical care, and public health. So you heard about public health. 
you heard about the PA. So these are the things that we do um, as biomedical informatics. As I mentioned, it's a master's degree uh, program um, that sort of help to improve healthcare. That is the ultimate goal. What is the aim? The aim is to improve human health. Human health. Right? So when you go to the doctor's office, the doctor is able to see your, your medical history, to see what kind of diagnosis that you had before, before coming um, today. So it's basically to help to enhance the human health. These are the courses that we offer, computer science. Has anyone taken any computer courses? No? What about database management? Have you heard anything about that? of help um, you to house all this information. We also teach medical, medical support, detailed support, medical imaging, which is some of those images that you saw today. So in this, um, uh, specifically, this is for, uh, for CAT, not for urology. And we have two tracks. If you have a computer background, you can take the uh, main course to talk or the have technology, then you also have to take um, the clinical aspect and gradual aspect. Types of work that is in medical informatics, as you can see from the we have to facilitate new rules to improve medical practices, right? Provide facility to um, improving communication. This morning you had you heard about communication school that was presented. So this is another way to kind We have to store using the database that we do for research, right? And also to, um, to assist with complex technology, becoming um, technology dependent and public health research. And ultimately, to come up with an innovative, innovative way um, to improve health. This is sort of um, a picture of electronic medical record or electronic health record. So this is some of the environment. Um, I know this is kind of a little uh, difficult at your level, but uh, hopefully when you come to the program, we'll be able to teach you the different aspect of this. As you can see at the bottom, you have the portal. This is where basically patients go in on, on, on your, either your phone, on your iPod, on your iPhone, Android, or even the computer to check your appointment check your medication, which pharmacy do you go to? So this is the way to capture those information. After you graduate, after spending two years, or even three years to four for part-time um, student, what do you have to do? Because this is uh, a master's degree program, meaning that you've already, you see that you're working, you've gone through your bachelor degree, and you're currently working, um, you're coming back as a professional to take professional um, degree, um, such as medical informatics. So these are the kind of jobs that you can get. Chief medical informatics officer, medical informatics director, uh, managers, analysts. Yes, you can see on the screen there are different types of analysts that you can, um, types of job that you can apply as an analyst. So this is one of the quotes that I borrowed from Dr. Luther King. He said, the time is always right to do what is right. So what you're doing right now is right. Being in high school is right. Taking those time and courses and do your assignments is, is very vital. It prepares you for your, for your future. It makes you to define who you will be and also to help the world to continue to do what you're doing today. I did it, I'm an immigrant from Nigeria specifically, and I came here and I did my, my, my uh, bachelor degree, my master's degree, as well as my PhD, and I know that you can too. Thank you. Any questions? And yeah, sure, go ahead. Maybe. Let, let, let me hear your question. Here you go. Sorry. Sorry. This 
would be a feel for people who want to work in the medical field but not really interact with actual people? Absolutely. So it's sort of an indirect way. It's an indirect patient care. You don't want to be a physician, or maybe you used to be a physician, but you want to now uh, work indirectly because you understand the system. Um, you don't want to you know, work with patient anymore. So this is in, in kind of um, a supplement that. Any other question? Um. Yes. What is the application specialist? Oh, application specialist is also an, an analyst. So they have to support and build electronic health records. They support it, they optimize it, meaning that they keep it running. On what platform? In what, what? Platform. In different platform. It could be, um, it could be Epic. Have you heard of Epic? Yes. Epic, okay. Offscript, we do use Offscript here. So different platform, Cerner. So we have different uh, EMR vendors that you can actually support. And in addition to that, you can also perform research to find uh, better ways to improve the system and different tools. Um, right here. Wh while you were growing up, was yes. this um, the field that you saw yourself doing, like this is what you wanted to do, or did you think you was going to do something else? Oh, good question. That is an excellent question, actually, that directed towards me. So I'll give you a little background of my life. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a physician. I wanted to be a medical doctor. But um, being an immigrant, coming from Nigeria, there's a lot of challenges. Um, it's a developing country, so it's not everyone that is opportune as you are here. So when I came here, I, I finished my high school and came over here, I wanted to do, um, going to uh, medicine. However, because of time, as well as finances, I could not. So I went over, I, I continued my educational path and did computer information system. After I did that, a classmate, I, I completed my, uh, my bachelor degree in computer information system at Lehman College. A classmate saw medical informatics advert somewhere and brought it to me because she knew how passionate I was um, to kind of work directly with patient. But when I couldn't do that and I saw that, I said, oh wow, what is medical informatics? And I went over on the internet, spent some time and research to find out what exactly is medical informatics. And I see that is a bridge between technology and the healthcare. I said, wow, this is really excellent. So this is how I decided to continue uh, my, my part and my desire, my dream as a medical uh, doctor, but an indirect way. Another question? Thank you. All right. Jumbo, thank you so very much for that uh, presentation about medical informatics. So we'd like to, SUNY Downstate would like to thank once again all of you for coming. We'd like to thank all of the faculty, the staff, Ms. Roberts, Celeste, Nandi, Mariam, uh, Mr. Bones, everybody, Ms. Desport, um, Alethea, there's a whole host of folks that made this program possible today. Ms. Uh, Kersent, <laughs> if I'm pronouncing it right. Thank you so very much. We thank AHAC. We thank all of the people that presented today. I can't see who am I, who am I missing back there. Tiffany, hi. Oh, hi, how are you? Tiffany, everybody. I don't want to leave anybody out. Really, what we want to do is just make sure that you think, think, think about all the different healthcare careers. Everything is available to you on the internet now. Get on, do some looking around, research, find your path, find what it is that you want to do. All of the occupations that we presented here for you today offer wonderful starting salaries in very short periods of time. Different from going to medical school, although doctors are wonderful, and nursing as well. So on your way out, please make sure that you hand in your surveys. Uh, all right, and we thank you very much for coming. We hope that you've enjoyed our program and that you've gotten something out of it. Take care, travel safe. Good day. You're welcome.